I'm Christian, and this is Theo Ballard. He's our resident physical therapist. Today, we're gonna to talk about the knee joint and why so many of you are getting in contact with us asking questions about why your knees hurt. A lot of you guys are running, rucking, and if you're honest with yourselves, lifting weights badly. Theo is gonna tell us about the knee joint, about the pain that you guys might be feeling, and he's gonna give us a couple of ways that we can address the pain. When we talk about the knee, it's sort of a tricky area of the body because it's right between two other parts of the body and the lower extremity specifically that dictate predominantly how the knee will function. So we talk about the hip, you talk about the, the ankle. Primarily, if they're not doing their job, then the knee ends up getting stuck in the middle and usually we think it's a knee issue, but it's actually something else. The knee's resilient, but it's also pretty fragile and we have to respect that. But with most training, you can, you can easily make it stronger. It's a hinge joint. So when you talk about a hinge joint, it's really good at just moving back and forth. It doesn't really like to be twisted and collapsed and compressed. And I think that's what we typically will see most of, of the time is it's being forced into that role when it's, it's really not designed to, to do that. I think at, at, at every point in our life, we're going to have knee pain, you're going to have back pain, you might have a little shoulder pain, but when is it not okay to, to just kind of hard charge and push through that? And for me, a lot of the big issues are swelling, whether uh, something occurs immediately and it's trauma, you, you, you move, you take a misstep, knee buckles, you feel something pop. That's a, that's a huge red, fla uh, red flag if you start to notice swelling, if there's a feeling like of a catch, instability. And that could also occur later. So you have a normal session, maybe you, you just hit the weight room like you always do, typical squat session or something, and then the next day you notice swelling in the knee. That could also be something indicative of a ligament injury. You know, just gotta be careful of just going right into an activity after you've had a traumatic event or after you notice the knee was moving fine, there's no click, there's no catch, you can move through full range of motion and then something happens and then you can't. So just expecting the knee to be able to function in that environment, that could lead you to, to even more serious injury. For a lot of guys whose job it is to move great distance under load, you know, who are, who are calling and complaining, I mean, it's a good chance a lot of these guys have real dysfunction, either, you know, upstream or downstream. So for the people who have to, you know, rock a bunch during the day who are experiencing knee pain, uh, what, what can you say to them? It's volume, volume's always an issue. And I think what we really have to do is look at what is your demands and giving your body enough time to prepare for that. Just like anything else, if you just jump right in one day and try to hit a 12 mile rock, it probably won't turn out well. You know, a lot of, a lot of people have a really good sense of, of drive and they can, they can grit it out. But if you're just treating every, every workout as, as selection or as assessment or as the, like the academy, it's not gonna end well. You're, you're gonna end up shortening your longevity. So really just giving yourself like time to prepare. But the supplemental piece that goes into that is what are you doing outside of rucking? Like what are you doing when you're not training? And I think that's even more important than just the training piece. So I like to talk about the big two recoveries, it's nutrition and sleep. And a lot of people who don't capitalize on those two are gonna always have an issue whether their programming is perfect. You know, that recovery piece is, is pretty important. I think with the population, those who get older and you get into the 30s and the 40s, you do see some mileage show up in the knee where you know, we're younger, the knee joints are nice and smooth, there's, there's, there's no erosion, bones aren't making contact as much, but you know, life happens, you, you spend a career with, with movement, with extra, extra weight on your shoulders, and yeah, you're gonna develop some of that arthritic change. So, you know, it's not a, a degenerative condition by any means, it just, it means you have to be a little bit smarter with, with your training. We try to implement a lot of low impact, low volume, low impact alternates to rucking. So, you know, if you have access to something like a Jacob's Ladder or even a Stair Stepper, you can, you can easily implement some of these pieces where you're still wearing the same weight, but it's not the, the intensity of the, the high impact of you know, even like a kit run or a ruck run, I'm trying to ruck significant amount of, of, of volume a week, I'm trying to lift significant amount of weight a week. Those two typically just don't go well together. You have to, you have to moderate those. So Theo, if you're experiencing knee pain, a lot of times the problem is not actually in the knee, it's downstream and upstream. And I know uh, last time you were here, we talked about uh, feet. Right. So what else, what else can you say about that? I mean, we shouldn't be looking at the knee necessarily first if we're experiencing pain there? Sure, yeah, so and, and again, kind of going back to even like a little bit deeper into the, the is this serious kind of category, red flag category, you know, does it, is, it, is it waking you up at night? Or, or do you have a fever, chills, sweating? Is it bilateral? The you swelling. you get a fever? If, if you have a bad enough knee injury, you'll 
get a fever? Well, if you have a fever and you have knee pain, then you need to go talk to your doc because it might not be the knee that's causing the pain. So yeah, like ruling some of these things out, is this actually like a musculoskeletal condition? Do you need to go talk to a physio or do you actually need to go talk to your, your medical doctor? Now, like say you clear all those things, nothing drastic with weight loss, like 10, 20 pounds in a week, uh, whether like, you're gaining or losing, like you clear all of that stuff, okay, Good, check, your knee hurts. The foot, the foot is very responsible for dictating where the, 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 the hip, the knee, the whole leg, where, is, where will that end up as you move? And if your foot's overly collapsed or if it's too rigid, you know, we always hear about overpronation and you don't hear too much about supination. So a lot of people have a very rigid foot. So if they're hitting, and they're hitting a heel strike and not even running, just walking, but that rigid hit doesn't allow the foot to conform to the ground. So, you know, if somebody's moving, whether running, walking with, with you know, equipment or kit, that energy can go right into the knee, it can irritate the knee, it can irritate the back. So we always look at the foot, we try to figure out is, is it an issue where the foot's just moving too much, if it's not stable enough. You know, you do want your knee to be exposed to some of these positions that can cause an injury and cause pathology, but we're definitely not going to do it in a way that is going to cause an injury with something that could be prevented. We look at the foot, but the hip is also just as important when you talk about actually moving up and down through a squat, deadlift, or changing direction, moving, moving with running. I know a lot of people in the fitness community when they start experiencing knee pain will jump right to a lot of mobility exercises for the knee or they'll do, you know, ART, band flossing, things like that. Sure. Is that time well spent? So in my case, it's, uh, I'm gonna say, if you have contact with a, a physio, let them take a look or at least hear you out and then they can save you a lot of time and energy because there are some, some conditions where, yeah, sure, like you use a little bit of soft tissue massage, some voodoo flossing, some mobility flossing, and you can clean it up a little bit. You can do some stretching and it helps. But the, the tendency is, if a little's good, I'm just gonna send this and I'm gonna crank on my knee and I'm gonna get this thing more flexible. And, and what we always what end I up do. seeing, right? So what we'll always end up seeing is, now it's not just a knee stretch, it's, it's actually a low back. You know, you're, you're twisting the knee in a position where it's really not supposed to go. So like my favorite is if you're just trying to get a little hip stretch and you'll, you'll see somebody try to bring the knee up here, but they don't have that. So they, they send it way out here and then they're cranking up here. And it, it's, it's, you're not really doing anything at that point. You're, you're kind of bypassing what you don't have. So spend a little bit more time actually addressing the, the real issue and don't feel like you have to be more aggressive. We know the massage helps with certain things, but it's very short term. If you had any kind of like passive treatment, it's just creating a, a bit of an environment for you to, to then in, in engage in what is the real issue that needs to now be addressed. And it could be stability. So just because something's tight doesn't mean it's, it needs to be stretched. And that's what I'm seeing more and more now is just that if somebody has tightness in their back and they're trying to stretch their back, it's like it's, it's probably not a tightness thing, it's an instability and your, your body is actually tightening up to try to protect itself. Because they're, they're not just check engine lights, they, they do give you a sense of awareness even if you're not having pain. I know you brought your table, would you be willing to like take me through what an evaluation would look like if I, would, you know, if I came to you with knee pain? Maybe show me a couple of things that you would look at in your office? Yeah, absolutely. So we'll okay. show the positions of the hip, position of the, the ankle, and I mean, obviously, obviously, I'm gonna show a little bit of the knee, but show you what those two other areas should be doing and then how that relates to what your body looks like in standing. Okay, so what we're gonna look at is how the, the whole lower extremity is moving and how that may impact the knee. Say you have knee pain and it's in a very isolated position, so right below the kneecap, uh, right on the soft tissue, so the tendon. You know, we talked a little bit about the, the, the tendon and what, what's different between a tendon and a muscle and how they should be treated. So. Specifically with the tendon pain we'll see, it's consistent with running. If you're ramping up your running too soon, too much too soon, those tendons aren't able to withstand the volume. They just haven't been exposed to it. So if you have specific pain there, uh, we'll kind of go over some drills on how to address that. But for the knee itself, like if you just have general pressure, there's just some, maybe some pinching or a little bit of pain on the inside of the joint or the outside of the joint, uh, we're gonna look at the hip and the ankle and how that might actually be influencing the pain. All right, so if I wanna look at just in general how the, the hip moves, can I just in a straight line take his knee in line with the hip straight forward? And I don't feel any resistance. He's not reporting any pain, catching. Uh, typically when I do this though, I'll, I'll hit a point right here where it just doesn't go anymore. And then that makes sense because I'll watch the person squat and they typically get a pretty wide stance. You know, feet are going out. They're turning off all the stabilizers that protect the knee and it ends up leading into the knee buckling and collapsing. So he's pretty good here, but he does look like he has some stiffness in the front and I can tell because this leg is starting to come up. 
So we'll, we'll kind of look at that when he's on his stomach. So he's good there. Now just rotation, can he rotate the hip? Because it's a ball and socket joint. And I need to know if that rotation, which is one of the first things that needs to occur before you can start to you know, take the shoulder overhead, before you can squat, before you can deadlift. And he's got good internal rotation. If I take him into external rotation, <clears throat> I do feel a little bit of stiffness there. And a really easy way you can test this on your own is if you hook your foot on the opposite knee and then just let that knee drop, but don't let the hip pop up. So I'm gonna block his hip at home, just make sure you're not letting that hip pop up. And he's just gonna relax his leg and let it drop to the side. And if he can't get that to, to drop to about parallel, then I know he's got some rotation restriction in the hip. Pretty stiff in the hip with rotation. Pain with that? No, it feels all right. I can feel I can feel a stretch though. Yep, so he might feel a little bit of a groin stretch. If I take the leg up and actually add some rotation going across the body, he'll feel it shift Ooh, to the outside shit. of the hip. It's a good stretch and this could be homework. So far, not too bad. Yeah, the rotation in the hip, which is typically what I'll see. And then going into the ankle and the foot. So really real quick, you've got you know two muscles in the ankle that can influence your ability to squat. If you can't pump your foot up and down, if you can't get that foot to at least neutral, then it puts a ton of pressure on the front of the knee. And what's happening is, if you can't bend your, your ankle to this point, it's forcing the knee to, to, to buckle sooner than it should. And as soon as he starts to bend the knee, it's just asking the quad to work a little bit harder than it needs to. And then you times that by however many steps and pretty soon that knee is going to be irritated. So he's missing a lot of, uh, a lot of ankle motion there. So I'd say with squatting, that's definitely going to, it's going to show up. And then if he goes on his stomach, so go ahead on your stomach for me. <clears throat> I'm going to test the other calf muscle. And with this one, this one doesn't cross the knee. So it's, it, it ends up around, right about here. So I'm just going to bend the knee and see if he's got a restriction there. And yeah, he's pretty stiff. So ideally you should be able to get to at least parallel before hitting resistance. And I'm hitting good bit of resistance there. So that's a, that's, a, that's a stiff ankle. And this by no means is rare. Like this is very common. Uh, so to me, it's, it's painting a picture of, okay, this makes sense. They're having knee pain. They can't, they can't access this joint. They can't access that rotation, which allows the knee to just sit into a nice stable position. The knee's ending up moving a lot more than it should. Okay, so that's pretty stiff. And then if I just bend his knee, I should be able to touch this or get pretty close without either seeing some movement here. So you'll see that arch in the back. He might actually feel some tightness occur. Oh yeah, in no the low chance back. you're getting all the way down. No. <laughs> so right there, I'm, I'm noticing some, some restriction and he's got a little bit of soft tissue mass here. So I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna take that into effect, but the quads in the front of the thigh are, are restricting that as well. So. Now, a good quick little back screen is, does that increase any low back discomfort? And if you sit, if you wear gear, if you're uh, you know, just generally noticing some back pain and you're in this position for prolonged periods, that hip flexor is probably a little restricted, okay? So did you feel anything in the low back there? Oh, I feel, I feel pressure for sure. Yeah, okay. So definitely some things we need to work on, we could address if he came in and the knee was swollen and he had a specific injury that he can remember, he was walking, Missed a step, boom, felt a snap pop. Now the knee is actually moving a lot more. I'm probably gonna bypass all this and, and okay, we need films, we need to figure out, did you or did you not tear a ligament? And that's the, the big difference is, if he can walk in here on his own, he's not limping, he's not hobbling, he, he, could, he could lift, he could train if he needed to, but he's smart enough to know that there's something not right. And the, the performance that he normally can hit, the numbers he knows he can normally hit, he, he's not hitting them, or he is, but it's taking a lot of effort. That's, that's the kind of knee that I'm, I'm talking about right here. Okay, so now that we found a few things that we know he needs to work on, I'm gonna show you how to actually work on those. And then what to feel and what to make sure that you're not doing incorrectly and where you shouldn't feel it and so forth, okay? But you know, we found that this hip was a little stiff with rotation. So if he bends both knees and stacks this knee as, as, as far over as he can. Do you feel any pain in the knee out here? No, no pain. Perfect, so we're off to a good start. So he doesn't quite have a 90 year old hip. It's close, but it's not quite a 90 year old hip. So he's gonna grab both ankles, one with each hand. And at that point, he should start to feel this top hip. He should feel a nice deep stretch on the outside of that hip. Yep. And he feels it. So he's not gonna hold his breath, right? So he can, he can breathe through this. If it's too intense, we're gonna back off, but 
He should be able to get oxygen flowing to those tissues, nice and easy, gentle breathing. But at no point should you feel sharp pain on the outside of the knee, sharp pain on the inside of the knee. And he's gonna hold this for about a minute, okay? Now he can change that direction. He can pull over to the right. He can pull this knee to the opposite shoulder a little bit more. He could even take this foot. So if you relax for a sec, he could even lie on his back and put this up on the wall and then really play around with the angle of that knee and maybe push this way, maybe pull straight across. So he can find those areas that just feel like they're restricted and work on it, okay? But at no point is he pushing through sharp pain, anything that, that feels like it's more aggressive than just a gentle stretch or even a pretty aggressive stretch, but it's all located on the outside of that hip, okay? So a really good stretch. And what he's doing is he's creating rotation. So as he's squatting, it's, it's really important that that hip has the ability to rotate out. And if he's missing that, he's gonna end up compensating by dropping his lower back into it, which is not ideal when you have weight on your spine. He's gonna end up having to turn his feet real far out. He might get a, a power lifter stance, get real wide and kind of shorten that range. So he's giving himself a more athletic capability, but he's also creating more position for him to just go and pick his kid up off the ground or maybe sit Indian style on the ground and play with his kid. So you know, this isn't just like weight room material. Our hips should be able to rotate pretty clean. The next stretch we're gonna hit this one is nice and easy for anybody to, to knock, knock out the hip flexor stretch in this position because it's taking some of the work off of making sure your lower back is not compensating. So most underrated stretch for low back pain, uh, especially if you're wearing gear or kit because of the way it offsets and has to manipulate your hip position, the, these muscles will adaptively shorten. So what he's gonna do, he's gonna go on his stomach and he's gonna bring the right knee and leg off the side of the table into a lunge position. And then I'm gonna steal this so just take something at home that's soft but stable and we're going to pull his hip into a little bit of extension so i'm going to prop this up underneath the knee and then if i'm his i'm going to be his stretching buddy so just relax for a sec he would typically just take a, um, a dog leash something stable you could use a jump band he'd hook it around his ankle and then he'd slowly start to pull but he's going to lie completely flat so there we go so now i know the back isn't it's not going to arch i'm not putting any stress here the opposite leg is lunged, so we're offsetting any stress that could be going into the lower back. And he's not arching up, so he's lying flat. And at this point, I'm already feeling a little bit of tension. I know he's feeling it. So right there, I'm hitting a good amount of resistance, and so that is a stiff hip. But this should be tolerable, so you should feel a pretty good stretch. Bottom leg actually is, yeah. Tight? Oh yeah, super tight. Yeah, so I mean, you're gonna wind things up in this position, but I think he's doing okay. I mean, I can, I can have him push back. So if he pushes with his leg, push back a little bit, hold there, good, and then relax. I should be able to go a little further. Uh, I want to make it real intense. I could have him squeeze his glute hard, and, and then now he's really going to feel that kick in. So squeezing here turns this off, so this can't guard. Okay, so this takes time, though. This isn't something that I want you to add two hours on a Sunday afternoon and just start cranking. Like you really have to start working these in uh, really daily. So everybody has those 10 minutes each day and you gotta find what, like, what do you need and, and, and go after it. One minute hold would be a good start, both sides. Run it back one more time. So you're looking at about two minutes on each. When he's finished though, back should feel a little lighter. Even if he just walked around and maybe retested a squat, it should feel a little cleaner. All right, so we identified a few restrictions in the hip. Uh, we evaluated those, pulled those out, gave him some correctives to work on for stretching. And now what we're gonna actually look at is loading those muscles we stretched, okay? Because yeah, the hip was, hip was a little stiff, but what we don't know is was it stiff because it is actually tight or was it guarding because maybe it's, it's a little weaker, okay? So obviously strength is not an issue for Christian, but stability might be, and stability and, and strength are not the same. So it's very important that we incorporate some of these movements into uh, either a warm up or a prep, or even just in between sets of other movements. The goal would not be to absolutely torch these muscles before maybe you go for a run or go squat. I wanna just do a little test and see, you know, can, can you perform 20 reps of a very isolated external rotation exercise? What he's gonna do is grab a, a mini band and nothing too, too crazy on this, all right? I wanna have some resistance, but I don't want a band where he, he's rolling his whole body. All right, so it's very specific to this area we're trying to target. So his top hand is gonna cradle his hip and his, his thumb will sort of be a spotter. If he starts to notice he's rolling into his thumb, then he's gonna correct his form. So he's gonna keep his feet <clears throat> in line with his, his hip and he's gonna bend the knees a little bit. And all he's doing is, is rotating this top knee up. He's gonna squeeze for a second and then nice and controlled back down. 
and he's just going to try to get 20 reps. So the, the goal would be, one, can you do it? Um, two, where do you feel it? A compensation, though, what he's doing, though, he's keeping good form, so he's got good control. What I'll typically see is this will speed up, so that band just starts snapping the knee back, which now you're losing control of, of probably the most important part of the movement. Or he'll start to roll that hip toward me. So I'll typically just kind of stand here and, and, and watch, and if they start to struggle, I'll, I'll kind of block the lower back. A lot of times, if somebody actually has pain, like if they get lower back pain, sort of similar, like right off to the side of the hip, while they're doing this, if they pin that spot, if you can find it with a lacrosse ball, you can pin that as you do this, and you're, you're cutting off circulation to that area that's, that's irritated. So you're loading the whole muscle, and after he does about 10, 20 reps, if he moves the hand Ooh. off the, the area, it actually will feel a little bit better, okay? Because now he's, he's feeding that area with a little boost of circulation, okay? So it's a good test, but it's also a good prep. So if he's about to go do something like squatting, if he's gonna run, if he's just gonna you know, train his lower body, no rest. We're gonna go right into the next one. So the bottom leg stays the same, hand stays the same. Top leg is gonna straighten out. And what he's gonna do is he's gonna kick from that angle, he's just gonna kick straight back at, like, at a diagonal, perfect, and back down. So he's gonna do 20 of these. And with this one, you'll start to see, again, is the back arching, is the hip rolling, or are, are you just staying in more of this vertical straight up and down, which is just gonna allow the, the front hip muscles, the hip flexors, which are usually pretty stiff, and we, we use those too much. It, it allows them to do most of the work. And then the last one, so don't really need a band for this. This is just more of a controlled position that goes against gravity, okay? So he's gonna go on his forearms, and he can bring the right knee up to about sternum height, and then he's gonna go onto his forearms, and then keeping this leg straight, he's just gonna lift the leg straight up and down. And one, if he's, if he's a little stiff in that hip flexor, we're not gonna quite see that line where he gets his leg in line with his hip. So he's still using, I mean, he is isolating his glute. So somebody that has a really tight hip flexor who tries to do maybe like a single leg bridge, they might actually use their back too much. So that's why I have his knee pretty far up. Good little drill too, after you stretch your hip flexor, because now you're training all of that new range of motion to be controlled by your hip and not your back. So you don't want to see the excessive movement in the back. You know, if you go to yoga class, if you follow any of the like YouTube Olympics, sometimes you'll see some people who have really good ideas and they, they, they demonstrate great exercises, but if you see this moving too much, you're not targeting the, the area that should be the, the main target. So those three, really good to do just as a self-test. Self-test, can you do 20? If you're using those as a warm-up, just hit 10, 10 each, roll right through, knock out the other side, and then move on to your, your, the rest of your, your warm-up. And what we're gonna look at now is how some of those progressions of exercises can be implemented in a standing position, but also just knowing what a good squat looks like and what maybe an inefficient squat looks like. If I look at how somebody's standing in general, it, it, without looking, I should be able to see, okay, my feet are straight, good. If I'm squatting, maybe I want a little bit of rotation. And remember, we talked about rotation. That, that's what the hip does. So as I descend, I should be able to let the hip rotate. Now, if you're this person or this person, that's an issue because now we know we're hiding behind something. So we're locking out the joint and we're actually moving in a position where we don't really have to access much hip rotation because you don't have it or you're locking out your ankle because you don't have the ability to pull the foot up. Okay, so if I asked him to get into his comfortable position with a squat, what, what would it look like? Okay, so not bad, but what happened as soon as he descended? One, he went real quick, so he tried to make it happen without anybody catching it. That was supposed to go slow? Right, yeah. so, and, and, <laughs> and look where he ended up. So his feet are way out here, and he's actually rounding a little bit in the back. So if I put him in a position where, you can come on back up. So I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna be a bully and make him squat here because that actually isn't ideal if, if you do have some hip pathology or even if your femurs are a little longer. So these things play a role. Not everybody's gonna squat the same and look the same. So if he puts a little bit of that, that outward turn, I'm gonna have him actually rip, rip the floor with his feet. So before he even descends, he's just gonna create a little bit of tension and what he should feel is now his hips kick in. So that's the, the trick with a deadlift and a, and a squat is you're preloading the hip. So as he descends, he's gonna practice a nice box squat, nice and slow. He's gonna to start to descend, and as soon as I start to see his feet turn out or any kind of movement maybe in his, his width or his, his low back starts to round, I'm gonna call it, that's it. Okay, that's, like, that's all he's got. So nice and controlled, let me see that hip hinge. Right there, 
So you can start to see the foot turns out. So now we know it's, it's, it's what we were talking about earlier. As he works on that, he'll be able to descend, but he's got to be really careful with going into that deep, deep squat position when you're missing that, that position because now you're actually causing more of that shearing in the knee. And then you might end up adding more pressure on your lower back and the bottom. Because if you get down there and you get stuck, you'll typically see the, the hip start to round and you kind of use this momentum bouncing effect and see tons of injuries in, in the, the clinic from just squatting, squatting heavy and just trying to drop quick and bounce and come back up. But the other thing that you're also doing is you're compressing the knee. So say if you had a meniscus injury, you might not notice it today, but tomorrow you wake up and you've got some swelling behind the knee, you've got some swelling in the knee, that's a meniscus injury, okay? So we're trying to protect the joints, we're trying to protect the, 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 the ligaments and the soft tissues in the joint. So kind of creating longevity. That's a pr pretty quick, easy way to just kind of uh, dial in your squat and really don't worry about the depth as much in you know, your squatting, like if you notice you can't get very far, that's why we implement single limb movements. Because in a single limb movement, he'll be able to go a lot deeper, he's giving his hip a little more motion to play with, and now he's actually teaching himself to move like an athlete. Because an athlete should be able to move multi-direction, you shouldn't just live in this, in this little box and just get strong. I mean, yes, we need to get strong, but we need to be stable and we need to be able to control our body in space. So the next thing we're gonna do, we're gonna look at his foot position. And right away, we notice that the left foot collapses significantly. So probably a lot more than we should. So I'd probably have him invest in some form of a, like a semi-rigid. So nothing that's just gonna completely lock the foot out, but it, it does take that extra little bit of play out of the equation so his foot, his foot stays stable. And that's going to keep the knee from buckling in. It's going to allow the hip to turn on when we want it to. If he goes into a single limb position, puts that right foot slightly behind off to the right, and then turns his body toward the left side, you'll notice that that arch starts to pop up. And he's creating an, a, a very efficient position for the hip to start communicating to the ankle to protect the knee, to protect themselves. Okay. So in that position, you can see he's got to use those muscles in order to stay in that position. So I could just have him hold that and kind of pump up and down. He's gonna to start to feel it here. Foot's gonna almost feel like a cramp. I mean, my foot's feeling fatigued just doing it right here. So that's how I know he's doing it right. So he can, he can take a break. You know, in the perfect world, we, we jump and we'd land. In sport, you jump, you get nudged, you come down this way. So eventually I might actually have him start working on maybe leaning, seeing if he can do a little bit of a mini squat, reaching, keeping that, that knee in line though. So it's, it's training the body like a flu shot. You're exposing it a little bit. So that way, if it does happen, it's not wheels fall off. It actually knows how to control it. We're gonna add a little bit of resistance and show what this would look like if you had a dumbbell or even a, like a kettlebell or if you were using some uh, cables or a jump band. I'm gonna have some resistance off to the side. So you won't see me, but you'll see the band. And all he's really gonna do is as he comes down, <clears throat> he's gonna load that hip and then he's just gonna stand it back up and he's creating rotation. So he's going into internal rotation, so that way as he comes up, by twisting his upper body, he's gonna be loading the hip muscles we want turned on and he's stabilizing his foot. So there's really no reason why his knee should be buckling in unless I had him start going this way, which isn't bad, but definitely more skilled. That's probably what we're seeing too much of, so we need to go the other way, okay? All right, so he's gonna grab with his opposite hand and he's going to go nice and controlled. No speed here. I want him to do some tempo work. So he's going to start nice and vertical. <clears throat> and he's just going to rotate his body toward the uh, left. And then as he reaches, come back up nice and controlled. So he's only, only going to go to a depth where he feels like he has control. He's breathing. He's got good control. He should be feeling some cramping in the foot. So he could easily do eight to 12 reps, but I wanna see what happens as he gets higher up. Does he start to fatigue? Does the form fall apart? Because that's what matters. How are you feeling? After a few more, my foot won't be able to hold me. Yep, so now we know we've got, we've got something going on at the foot. Good, okay, Ooh. so we're gonna take a break. He's gonna go throw up, we'll be right back. So, <laughs> But <clears throat> what we're trying to figure out here though is, Okay, so he's got knee pain. Say maybe he has knee pain when he runs. Well, right away, I know. I mean, if he's standing and maybe he likes to stand like this, well, we're moving too fast when we run. You don't have everybody, or you don't have the chance to film yourself running straight on. But as you fatigue, yeah, maybe that foot's collapsing. It's pulling the knee with it. Uh, or if he's squatting, if he's squatting heavy and he's going fast, maybe he's just squatting body weight, going fast reps. But 
if you don't give the the joints and the muscles the ability to stabilize you you get into those positions way too quickly and you don't have time to stabilize them so by the time you're you're there you, you don't even have time to set it up so you get in you get out and all of a sudden that stress is just repeated by however many steps reps um, and then that's how the pathology and the injuries occur because it'll just um, kind of compound on itself the, the, the knee is a hinge joint but it, it doesn't mean that we need to just be rigid the whole time okay and when you do squat, don't, don't feel like you, you are trying to pull your knees past where your feet are. It's a cue. The cue is drive your knees out, but it's the same as I told him with rip the floor. So ripping the floor is, is actually engaging the hips the same way driving your knees out. But if I go this way, it's just as damaging to the joint as if I went this way. I'm just changing the angle of which side is being compressed and which, which side is being stretched. So a lot of injuries occur that way because we think that, okay, well, I know I don't want to do this. So... I'm just gonna jam these things out. And it's the same with a deadlift. If we, we, if we know that this isn't ideal, so I'm just gonna lock this back. We really have to be careful with the, the cues that we, we hear and what they feel like. Because you could cause an injury, even though you know you're trying to do, do the right thing. So we hope you guys enjoyed what we showed you today. If uh, you found it useful, go ahead and implement that into your training. If you have any more questions or if you want to find out more information on how to take the next step, visit tvphysio.com. But you can also grab a copy of my Always Ready Manual. It's a good way to self-check yourself, make sure you're not going to set yourself up for an injury. But it also gives you the ways to help prevent injury and reduce pain and just generally improve performance. We're going to post a link to that manual in the description. And if you like this video, it is part of a series. We're going to be working our way up the body and covering different joints and different problems. So click subscribe and click like. Make sure you ring the bell.